and there is a hint on literature also in the title of her book. So, uh, was Alice Shalek a woman without qualities? Thank you. We'll find that out. I hope. Um, yeah, as already mentioned, um, the title "Woman Without Qualities" is borrowed from Robert Musil's monumental work "Men Without Qualities." He started working on this novel or on, on this literature corpus in 1921, and it was one of the best books that captured the angst of the transition in the late Austro-Hungarian Empire. The novel is a story of ideas, just as my today's presentation with presentation will try to be. I don't want to follow Eilis Schalek's life trajectory, but want to focus on the development of her ideas, or maybe even lack of them. The protagonist of the first book of Robert Musil Ulrich is in a search of a sense of a life and reality, but fails to find it. His ambivalence towards morals and indifference to life has brought him to being a man without qualities, depending on the outer world to form character. And let's see what kind of outer world was the world of Alice Schale. She was born in, uh, in 1874 in a bourgeois Jewish family in Vienna. It was just slightly too early for her to be possible to study, and later in life she often mentioned her lack of formal education and and also the importance of, of the education for gaining a job. Her first novel, Van Via der Stagen, When Will It Happen, was published in 1902 under the male pseudonym Paul Mihaili, and it dealt with the question of women's education and work. The problem of female education is, according to Schalek, that girls receive different education than boys. Girls only get to know arts, but boys also learn about, about what it means to live the state. They learn about real things, such as finances and politics, whereas girls can only recognize a quote, different fresco paintings and learn how to play the piano. Girls get, get as Schalek wrote, pseudo-education, and boys are the ones who get the real education. What the girls gain in school is training in femininity. Therefore, that's her quote, therefore women can get real jobs. Of course, they can become a nurse, a teacher, a governess, but Chalik perceives this job as unambitious, especially because they don't offer any possibility for climbing the social ladder. For a woman who wanted to climb the social ladder of her time, marriage was still one of the few possibilities, but Chalik was strongly against it. As a su successful example of a modern woman, Chalik introduces a young Norwegian woman that inherited her father's company, and it's now its boss. And here is the quote. <coughs> We want to become people with a purpose in life, a life content, so we no longer have to sell and objectify ourselves. We want to become merchants and civil servants, hand workers and teachers. We absolutely want to stand on our own feet and not to have to sell our lot in the, for the sake of daily bread. In 1909, Alice Schalek published her last work of fiction for the next 20 years. Since 1903, she was the editor of the liberal daily Vietnamese newspaper, Neue Freie Presse. She worked for this newspaper for almost 30 years. <coughs> we don't know the reason why Alice Schalek stopped writing fiction and decided to become a full-time reporter, traveler, writer, and photographer. At the time when she wrote her last work of fiction, she was 35 years old. It is reasonable to believe that she decided to follow a career that was promising a regular financial income rather than a financially uncertain artistic path. She was able to get a steady work, an intellectual one, but she produced it in the frequency and style that could be compared to mechanical repetition, labor. Five years later, when World War I break, broke out, she was invited as one of the only two female reporters into Crown Public Space Aquatia, the center of propaganda institutions um, of the Austro-Hungarian armed forces during the World War I. That was a big career step for her. She accepted, the, she accepted her place in the civil society of artists, whose job obligation was to promote the success of Austro-Hungarian armed forces. At this point, I will not discuss her role and involvement in the World War I. This part of Schalek's life has been well researched, but I will focus, focus on her professional position regarding her gender. As still today, war reporters are mainly male, it's a very male-dominated field, so when we talk about the area of the First World War, it is an extreme position, and I will focus her gender regarding that. In one of the most famous <coughs> plays of the World War I, The Last Days of Mankind, the play of Carl Krauss that is always mentioned in connection to Alice Schalek, 
She was portrayed as a joke of a female journalist that is not aware of the world around her. The only thing that matters to her are the deadlines and the excitement. She finds her work more important than other people's lives. The similar position towards Alice Schalek had deputies of Austrian Christian Social Party that filled the complaint to the defense minister against her work in 1917 for the reason that she enjoys, I quote, the female sensationalism and unvaried, unvaried adventureness where men take pleasure and their duty to suffer for their fatherland. According to the interpolation in the, in the writings about her, she was at the same time not womanly enough. She was unmarried, independent, had, um, had for her time extremely masculine profession, but at the, but the same time her female features, curiosity, naivety, nervousness, anything, were supposed to make her incompetent. Girl can never win, can she? Alice Schalek embodied several conflicts, not because of the way she was, but because of what she dared. Harold Krauss also called her an unwoman and wrote. This is Harold Krauss. Um, this is um, Alice Schalek. This one sometimes. Um, this is one of the um, quotes from um, one of the newspapers about her. Um, yeah, and Harold Krauss wrote. It has become possible for the public to be given obscene diary sheets of a woman mm. that knows no other way to simulate his femininity than in the field of honor. Stimulation of femininity in this context has an implicit sexual connotation and could be perceived as dishonorable for a, woman of, for a woman of her generation, especially if unmarried. The same goes for the scornful use of the word man-wife, unwoman. In July 1916, Ali Shalek filed a lawsuit against this particular article and this, its author. She sued him for, for public abatement and contempt and and for violation of her personal honor. In her statement of grounds, she claimed that her profession of a war correspondent was attributed to, I quote, erotic and sensual motives. And she believes that, I quote, her female qualities were attacked and were shown as if she was drawn to immoral and dishonorable behavior. Ali Shalek felt that her honor was publicly attacked, but the same goes for Karl Krauss. He too saw her existence as a threat to his own and also public honor. Pierre Bourdieu claims that men have an exclusive right to govern all public activities, especially when it comes to the field of honor. And nothing speaks of male honor more than a war. Manliness is to be understood as the ability to fight and act violently, and is therefore a distinctly re relational term. Man becomes a man, writes Bourdieu, in the presence of other men and for them. With her presence in the area of honor at the battlefield, Ali Shalek threatened the essence of the concept of masculinity. Her critics sensed this, but were unable to express their frustration with anything but an insult. Her Carl Krauss appeared against her lawsuit again in 1970. His writings prove how much he cared about the concept of masculinity and femininity, and once again he attacked Shalek's honor, this time with the conviction that she was not at all a woman. I quote, the plaintiff believes that her female qualities were attacked. Already the strange view that womanhood is only a female quality just justifies my attack. The applicant was not attacked in her female quality, but in her male quality as a war correspondent. Once again, Krauss humiliated Shalek with proclaiming for her for a man. Shalek's labor defined her and took her away her biological gender. As Mary Bird put it, women who speak publicly in most cases weren't defined as female. Alice Shalek lost her job due to public pressure and personnel changes in its place of in 1970. And now we will go to the transition of In the 1920s, she produced many articles for different Austrian newspapers. It was extremely important for her that she was a working woman. She was even one of the founders of the Federal Association of Working Women in Austria and was very active in several other women's organizations. She was not a worker, but intellectual worker, as she liked to call herself. Anne Schalek was rarely, rarely directly engaged, politically engaged, especially when it came to Austrian politics, but she wrote more freely about it when it came to political questions abroad. Since we are in Trieste, I chose an article that she wrote, for example, from the year 1921. What strikes the reader here the most are different registers of understanding politics and its context. She opened the article with a political description which goes, 
It's a mortal shock for communists that their opponents can pull themselves a party of order and can be elected, although in reality they are adding to this order and nobody really agrees with them. Their side program is the Nuncio's nationalistic propaganda and the complete ownership of the Mare Nostro, which makes even the level-headed Italians uneasy. One could assume that this would be the beginning of the political article, but Charlotte later on mixed different ideas. She wrote about beautiful soldiers who strolled, um, who strolled down the streets of Trieste. She wrote about, she liked how hard to discuss the prices and compare the price of a silk dress in Vienna and in Trieste. She described what kinds of food, food and vegetables were available, farmers market, and she was said to see that the shipping company Austrian Lloyd is renamed into Lloyd Triestino, and she compared the names of ships and realized how none of them is no longer carries an Austrian name and how her Austrian heart is breaking inside. Nonetheless, he spent a great deal of this article describing the greatness of Lloyd Triestino and visiting the success of the company. The article about Trieste is a good example of Alice Alex's afterward writing, because just as she starts getting political, she changes the topic, and her political convictions are never fully articulated. This makes it hard to follow her ideological development. In the 20s, she made several interviews with important German industrials and capitalists. From, in, from inflation scheme to the Fugostinos to Quadroga, from Krupp AG, Paul Reusch, Felix Deutsch, Karl Bosch, and, so on, and many others. Charlotte's attitude, attitude towards them didn't change to the end of the 20s. She, she always tried to find their best, most human characteristics, even though they, for example, opposed the eight hour work day, hated trade unions, and so on. She always described them as really nice men, and she, was, she always seemed to be on their side. But then the 20s were over, and in the beginning of the 30s, she published the three books, she returned to writing fiction again. And she published three books in Soviet Union. After more than two decades of writing non-fiction, she wrote, um, she wrote about decolonization, a novel with the title The Books of Tag, The Big Day, or, and communist stories for children. It was not unusual for Europeans of the 30s to sympathize with Stalinism, but it was unusual for Alice Shelley to make such a sharp turn left. The tone of her novel is clear from the beginning, and it's very strange how the same person <coughs> a year before did not oppose someone who was against eight hour workday, but then, and the next year, she wrote things like this. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah, this one. I quote, if only poor organize themselves and follow the Communist Party. We can now do what is about, uh, absolutely necessary, namely to destroy the class of Kulaks, a genuine contra-revolutionary plan that stands in the way of building socialism. It's hard to understand Shalek's transition. It came suddenly and abruptly. And also, in, just as it appeared, in the, it then disappeared. Except of these books, there is no other evidence about her Stalinism, nor before or after. In 1933, she was arrested by Gestapo because she possessed photos of carnival procession in Palestine that in Palestine that apparently mocked national socialism. She managed to emigrate to the United States when she died in 1956, 82 years old. There are not many documents from her American years to be found, but in 1941, as she was 67 years old, she replied to the letter of Gertrude Redlich that, um, who asked her to join the ladies' committee. She claimed that she has no interest in giving money, collecting money, or in any political engagement. She was very clear with not wanting to have, not wanting to do anything political or to be publicly recognized. She wrote, it's completely, it's completely out of the question for me to do any political work to be under the complete anonymity without any contact, contact with co-workers who definitely speak to their wives about me. And this is not how you keep a secret. I may not go public with my name under any circumstances. And her name really didn't appear publicly in her American years. A woman who most of her life fought to be heard in the public space spent her last 15 years in almost complete anonymity and silence. And now to conclude. Even contemporary biographies, it's hard to find source that would date Alice Child or someone with intellectual capacities. For example, the web portal 1940 to 
1918 that was established by Austrian National Archive in the commemoration of the century of the World War I, mentioned, mentioned in the first sentence of her profile that she is remained known, I quote, to the devastating criticism of Tara Krauss, especially because of her role in Tara Krauss's play. <laughs> Such contributions evoke the impression that Tara Krauss, the male intellectual, is an objective norm, even historical judgment itself, where she is merely an object of an objective judgment of historical footnote. In fact, as also shown in this paper, the role of Carol Krauss and Shalek's side was anything but objective. Shalek's case is a good example that, rep that represents the perception of female intellectuals, the position they had in, they had in public space, and the way they were remember remembered or mostly forgot. It also evokes the question of what did it mean to be an intellectual and what kind of ideological and gender bias is connected to, the con to this concept in the early 20th century, but also in today's histori historiography. Why is Anna Schalix, as someone who reproduced intellectual labor for more than 50 years, not remembered as the intellectual? The fields of history of labor and history of intellectual labor are mostly separated. One is an intellectual. It is not something you practice, but something you are. It often sounds like a privilege, and it actually is. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go deep enough into the concept of the term intellectual, but I will try to sum it up. Jean-Paul Sartre claimed that intellectuals are more conscious of their age and that moral and ethical responsibility is to speak freely in the society in accordance with their conscience. Sounds nice, but it's hardly applicable to any woman born in the 19th century or, century or, or earlier. How to speak in accordance with your conscience if the society and the educational system convinced you that you don't have one, or even if you do, it's not relevant and can, or cannot be publicly expressed. For Pierre Bourdieu, the most important characteristic of being an intellectual, it, to be an intellectual is to belong to the autonomous world and shape of your values in connection with the autonomy. But as Stephen Fuller points out, it's easy to demonstrate autonomy if you come from a wealthy background. Autonomy is much harder to demonstrate if you come from a poor or proletarian background. <coughs> but we have to add that autonomy in intellectual or any other field is not about class, but it's also about other privileges such as skin color or in case of other shallow gender. And really to conclude, what most definitions of the term the intellectual have in common is that the intellectual has to be in eternal opposition. Anna Shalek couldn't afford to be in a terminal position if she wanted to survive with her intellectual work and have a job that she wanted. It is easy to diminish her as someone who produced propaganda first for Austro-Hungarian monarchy, then for capitalism, and then for Stalin. But in this sense, she was a woman without qualities, just as Ulrich in Musil's book. She was shaped as the, by the turbulent world of transitions around her. She was depending on the outer world from, the, from her character and also her work.